All right, well, we are embarking on a rather strange topic tonight. Um, I know that for many of you, it, you're probably thinking it's a very strange topic, and it is. Um, you know, Hollywood has made such a, a big thing out of UFOs, aliens, E.T., Close Encounters, I mean, the movie was Close Encounters of the Third Kind, but um, they, they're, they're up to seven now. There's, there's seven different types of Close Encounters. Um, and I realize that for many of you, you know, you might hear all this stuff. Maybe you're just here to see just how strange Ken Hessler get. <laughs> or, um, you know, you, you think, this is just a weird topic. Like, I don't even know why someone would talk about this in church. I think I, I probably would have thought that years ago. Um, I have a different view than you, if that's your view. Um, I have a different view because I've come to realize over the years that as bizarre, and it is, let's face it, um, as bizarre as the whole topic is, UFOs or call them UAPs, whatever you want to call them, um, ETs, not the cute little ET in the movie, you know, but, you know, extraterrestrials, are they real? And that whole question, did they travel here from, you know, a planet in our solar system or some other solar system or another galaxy altogether? After all, we, we all know that everybody flies at warp speed. Um, you know, that's how we've been conditioned as a, as a people. We've, you know, we've gotten our ideas of uh, the, what we... What we what we've been told is science, which is not science at all, um, but it's fiction, and, but yet we believe these things. And so for the church, what's happened, I think, for many Christians is that many Christians just say, no, 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 no. it's just bizarre, and that, this is not real. It can't be real, uh, because we all know that, you know... Is that really what you think? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly what many people do. I, f I completely forgot about that slide. Um, people do it in, in general, but the church of Jesus Christ has done it on this other topics too, but has done it on this topic. There is one barrier you can be assured of. You know, one barrier against learning anything uh, one barrier against uh, coming to know the truth, and that's the principle of condemnation before exploration. Um, I think I, I quoted this proverb a couple weeks ago, but uh, Proverbs 18, verse 13, he that answers a matter before it's known or before he hears it, to him it's folly and a shame. And sadly, as much as, as Christians, we may know how to quote the Proverbs, that's a proverb that really does apply to us, and too often the body of Christ is just saying, absolutely not, these things can't be. And of course, if you were to ask the question, well, why is it that these things can't be? Um, many of us would answer as, well, God just doesn't allow that kind of stuff. He just doesn't do that. No, he doesn't do that, but why doesn't he allow it? How do we know that God does not allow these things? Um, I think that I'm not going to go down that road now. We can touch on it later on. But uh, so as we get into this tonight, uh, I realize that for many of you, for some of you, this may be your first time. <laughs> if it's your first time here at church, <laughs> I do hope you'll come back because uh, we don't typically do this. <laughs> we really don't. Um, but I've learned over the years as a pastor, it's important that we do address these topics that as weird, as, as icky, as they may seem, and sometimes icky is the only word. Uh, they're important for us to look at. You should have received two sheets of paper. Uh, one, the chartreuse one, Greg, chartreuse is the color. Um, on, uh, on one side, it says bibliography. So if you're interested in, in sources, there are a lot more, uh, but these are some pretty good sources, okay? Um, uh, it, 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 well, let, me, let me read this. So one side is bibliography, the other side, you've probably seen it before, but reliable sources, uh, I try to update it from time to time. So reliable sources uh, for global news, biblical truth. So mostly it focuses on uh, news, uh, but also there are um, websites on, on this sheet that you can use uh, in terms of studying the Bible. So if you have questions about that, you can ask. And then the, uh, the very hot pink 
uh, sheet of paper, which if we, if we lost power in the room and it went dark, you'd still be able to read this. Um, thank you, Jess. It's, really, it's great. It really stands out. I like bright. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't know that I'm going to follow the outline, but this, roughly speaking, we'll cover these things tonight. In terms of bibliography, uh, as I mentioned, great. Uh, there's some great books here, not because I said so, but because I think so. Ha! <laughs> um, no, they are. They're, they're really good. Um, one of the guys I've really come to like a lot is Michael Heiser. He's with the Lord now. Um, he passed away earlier this year, actually a few months ago now. But uh, Heiser's real, I mean, the, the one that really put him on the map was uh, The Unseen Realm. Uh, I, I like him for a lot of reasons, but he's also, uh, he was one of those experts, if you could name someone as an expert, an expert in ancient uh, biblical and, uh, and dead languages too. Um, but uh, so Hebrew, uh, all the Semitic languages, et cetera, et cetera. So, but uh, great guy, and, and he interprets the scripture well, in my opinion. Uh, so he's also written, you can see in the bibliography, he wrote, he wrote this book. He wrote a book on angels, a book on demons, a book called The Reversing Hormone. Uh, but anyhow, he's written more than that. He's, he's great. Good guy. I think you'll find it. It's not one of those really thick, like, oh, wow. Uh, you know, this is heavy. It's not that heavy. It's actually fairly easy to read. Um, and uh, just, you don't care about this, but, I, but I'll say it anyhow. Um, I tend to, because of what I do, you know, I, meaning I study and th those things, I, I usually say to people, I kind of like read for a living. Um, and, and so sometimes I just get tired of the reading. Much as I enjoy reading, sometimes I just get tired of the reading. So certain things I will, um, I'll listen to. If you, have a, if you haven't gotten your, if, and if you can afford, it's not that difficult or not that expensive. If you can afford a subscription to Audible, Audible is really a great, uh, a great thing to have. You, can, you, you buy books in, with credits. You, know, you pay a certain amount of money, you get credits, you buy the books. And they have a great business model, which to me is kind of stupid, but that's their problem. Um, if, you, if you say, I want to return the book after you read it, I mean, sometimes they say, that's enough, Hester. You can't return all those books. But you return the books. I read it. Why do I want to keep it in a library that's on my phone? You know, that's silly. So give me another book. And, um, and that way I can listen to it, you know, cutting the lawn or driving or something like that. So you don't care about what I do. But I mean, I'm just saying it's a way of reading things that otherwise you might feel like you're getting bogged down reading stuff. So it's Unseen Realm is not necessarily the best book to listen to. There's things you ought to read, you look at, I found. But uh, it's, it's, it's a good way of reading some of these other things. I'm not going to go through all these, but I just want to point out who some of these people are. So uh, first one on the list, Timothy Alberino. Um, and the one, uh, where are we? About halfway down, Marzulli, L.A. Marzulli. Um, he, he's, both of them are a bit of an acquired taste. Um, but uh, I like them both. I, uh, I'll name drop. I did a prophecy conference with L.A. Marzulli, and that was an experience and a half. Um, but I like L.A. Not everybody does, I realize. But he's, he's sort of picked up the mantle that Chuck Smith, Chuck Smith that Chuck Missler uh, left after he went home to be with the Lord. Uh, Marzulli picked up that mantle in terms of the Nephilim and strange things. He's gone where no one has dared to go before. And so uh, I, I like him and, uh, and Alberino, people like this have sort of followed in his footsteps. Um, and probably the last one I'll mention no, there's a couple more. I would definitely mention these two down toward the bottom. Peterson, Ryan Peterson, has written two great books, um, The uh, Judgment of the Nephilim and The Final Nephilim. Great stuff. Um, he's, I like him because he, he approaches it in a scholarly way, but he doesn't write like a scholar. That's a great balance. Not many people have figured out how to achieve. That makes him smart and readable all at the same time. Uh, some guys are educated beyond their intellect, and it's like, I don't even know how to read what you're saying. Um, but I like him that way. And also... Um, who else would I say? Oh, the last one. Yeah, I would tell you, it's worth, if you're interested, it's worth your while. Blurry Creatures is a podcast. Some of you are probably blurry converts, and you, you, and you, and you listen in the blurry verse. Uh, but these guys, two, two believers uh, who have this podcast, and they, they bring in people who have had what they refer to as blurry experiences, you know. Uh, and so I, uh, I recommend them. They're, it's worth, you know, again, this is all acquired taste, so do as you wish. So tonight, 
uh, what I'd like to see us do, if we could, we're going to spend uh, l less than an hour at this point. We'll finish up at, uh, before 8.30. We'll take a break, and we'll come back and do uh, Q&A. So uh, we're not going to get into, per se, it's not about you know, end time prophecy, although I think this is all a part of end time prophecy, but uh, we're not going to get into all those matters here. The question, of course, has to do, first of all, with UFOs. Are they real? And our time tonight is not going to be spent on all that stuff. There, you, know, you can find a lot of the stuff on your own. UFOs, are they real? And let's get past the shock value of things. Uh, as I said earlier, um, many, um, many believers, and um, in many ways, especially believers in kind of like my age range and some of you who I can see out there, um, have a tendency sometimes, as I said, as believers to say, nah, this just, nah, not true. Well, you got a lot to plow through then because then you have to write off everything. Uh, there's been so much going on, and I'm one who, you know, I started when Project Blue Book was happening back in the early six, late 50s, early 60s. I, mean, I was a little kid, and I was aware of Project Blue Book, and I was, I, I've never seen a UFO. Anybody seen a UFO here? Raise your hand. How do you know? It was unidentified. Ha, ha, ha. But, no, really, and seriously, anybody seen a UFO? Don't be afraid to raise your hand. Okay. Um, I didn't ask if you were abducted. That would be a different question. Uh, we could talk about... Oh, that explains a lot, Dave. Okay. <laughs> um, but in any event, so I've been aware of this since I was a little kid. And the thing that I came to realize, and even by my teens, that's a long time ago, was that you can write it all off. You can say, no, no, a bunch of bunk. Then what is it? Are you going to say it's all swamp gas? Uh, are we going to just write it all off and say people are imagining things or they're making it up to, you know, to, to have their you know, five minutes of fame somewhere? I think even if you said 95% of it was made up, that 5% is still thousands of people in America alone who have had some types of, at that point, if we've, if we've qualified them and said 95% were, were dumb you know, they, they weren't reliable, but these 5% were. You have thousands of experiences that you have to deal with. And, uh, and we'll get into more of this later on, but there have been a lot of experiments that have been done, uh, psychological experiments done on those who claim to have had abduction experiences. And we're not plowing into all that tonight. I'm just kind of touching on some of these things. Who claim to have had abduction experiences and almost to a person, men and women, they will say that, um, they will say under hypnosis. They, they may not, have, have, it wasn't in their consciousness to recall what happened to them when abducted, but under hypnosis, in other words, outside of their control, they claim to have had experiences where some type of surgical procedure was done on their genitals. This is an R-rated thing. So um, on genitals, and it brings up a lot of questions. Uh, and so a lot of things we can touch on, we'll probably get into the, maybe some of the more difficult stuff in Q&A. But um, if, if what has been observed, and especially even just in the last 10 years, what naval pilots have seen, uh, lots of uh, our astronauts have had experiences. I'll touch on some of that later on. Um, if, if, in fact, these unidentified flying objects or these UAPs um, are real, now you have another question. Even, even just from a non-Christian perspective, well, then what are they? Are they hostile? Are we at risk? Let's say just, just one example alone. Um, when you on the topic of UFOs, where you know there's not any kind of actual contact made with you know some some operator of the craft, um, the observation of these incredible speeds that the craft will travel at, and then make an amazing hairpin turn that goes beyond our concept of physics, go beyond our concept of what a, a human body could could withstand in terms of g force and that type of thing. What do you do with that? Because if there's a technology that's being used there that 
we don't know how to deal with, how, how to create, how to control, or how to withstand in terms of the human body, uh, but, but another force of some, meaning another, uh, I, I don't want to call it a race, because I think we're, we all understand we're not talking about visitors from another galaxy, but in terms of common public opinion, not Christian, um, then the question is, well, are they hostile? If they have a technology which is greater than ours, or even collectively greater than ours, Russia's, China's, Western Europe, et cetera, uh, and it's a technology that just beats ours, that sounds like a great risk we're dealing with, unless you just want to write it all off, say, no, it's not real. La, 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 la. Uh, so, um, so uh, you know, uh, I'll leave that. And let me li name a couple of... Uh, Astronauts. I think many of us may not be aware. Um, I know that, uh, what's his name, Irwin was one who was convinced, not only was he Christian, uh, actually a number of our astronauts have been Christians, but um, he, was, uh, he was born again, and uh, not only had he seen, claims to have seen, some type of alien vessel while he was in space, um, he was... Uh, Anyhow, he pursued some other things. And let me name some of them off. Ed Mitchell, Apollo 14. I realize for many of the ages in here, I know that a lot of these will ring a dinger for you. The younger ones may not. Uh, Ed White and James McDivitt. Um, uh, they were on Gemini. The Gemini in June of 65, they saw a UFO uh, with arms sticking out of it. They claim to have seen it. And these are astronauts. These are they're highly trained Okay, military, engineers, I mean, you know, the mindset, think of the mindset. Uh, James Lavelle, Frank Borman, remember them, um, on their second orbit, Gemini 7 in December of 65, uh, the second orbit of their 14-day flight, they saw a UFO. Um, Gemini Control presumed that it was the final stage of their, their booster rocket, um, but they indicated they had both... Uh, they had both the booster and the UFO in sight, so it was not their booster. Uh, Walter Schirra, um, actually, he was the first one who used the code name Santa Claus. It was a code name they'd worked out for seeing something, but they didn't want to excite the public uh, because sometimes you, you know the NASA uh, communications get broadcasted. So we see Santa Claus. Um, uh, they, in other words, they saw UFOs near the, the capsule. Uh, Gordon Cooper, um, let's see couple others. Neil Armstrong, remember him? Yeah. And Buzz, you know, Buzz Aldrin. Um, they both apparently, this is July 69, as you recall, they both apparently saw lights in and on a crater uh, on the moon. Uh, and there were unconfirmed reports that there were other spacecraft there. Two large objects were watching them, in their opinion. Um, and then uh, John Blaha. Uh, so anyhow, these are, these are some guys who have had these kinds of um, experiences. I don't know what you want to do with some of that, but I guess I'd leave it there. I said leave it. I don't leave anything anywhere. Uh, uh, let me say something else um, just to get... I don't want to get real creepy, so don't, don't misunderstand what I'm doing. But uh, when I was... Uh, when I live in Colorado, single man, and uh, my buddy and I used to do a lot of, you know, camping trips in uh, southwestern Colorado. And that was the summer of 67. And that was the first time we had ever, we had a lot of, we did a lot, of, you know, camping trips in Colorado. You can camp, camp everywhere, but the West Slope is where most people like to go. And uh, we spent a lot of time on the West Slope. And you get to know ranchers as, you know, you stop for breakfast in some little diner somewhere. You start to hear, and that was the first time I'd ever heard anybody talk about a cattle mutilation. Uh, some of you ever heard, anybody heard of cattle mutilations? Okay. Uh, it's still going on, by the way. It's actually going on in a very big way. And um, that was the first time that Jim and I had, not Jim and I, Jim and I, uh, had ever heard that, that thing. We asked what it was about. We thought the guy was pulling our leg. But it, it seems to have started around 77, and, uh, and it continues today. And for those of you unfamiliar with this, the idea is pretty much as it says, and I won't get gross, but, well, at least in my opinion, I won't get gross. Um, but the idea is that, you know, a rancher comes across, you know, one of his animals dead uh, in the pasture, and, you know, certain organs are surgically removed, 
all the blood is drained out. There's no, uh, th there's no evidence that any predator, animal, or, or human has been anywhere around it. No trackers can find tracks, the predator tracks. Um, and yet the, the surgery is, it's clearly surgical. It's not a ripping and tearing type of thing. Um, some here thinking, like, why, why does he do this stuff? Um, I say it not, not to get a rise out of you, but I want to get a rise out of you. I'm not making it up. And it's not like it happened once and, and you know, it never happened again. And it's not like someone made it up. It really is true. You have to ask the question. You, you, like anything else, you can say, blah, 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 blah. That stuff doesn't happen. I don't believe it. Okay, don't believe it. But talk to the, the, the hundreds, many hundreds of ranchers on the west slope of Colorado. Basically, it's the mountain west, so Wyoming, uh, uh, Montana, parts of Utah, and Colorado is, uh, the, are those who have the primary experiences with this. Why is it happening? I don't know. But it points, the reason I bring it up is that it points to something that some of you are familiar with, meaning you, 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 you're, you're maybe a little bit more lucid with the, uh, or fluent with the idea, but many of us just would rather not talk about it, and that is this whole Nephilim matter. Um, let's try to do this if we can. I want to go quickly, but I want to kind of cover it all if we can so that by uh, you know, the end of our session together, those of you who just need to get out of here, um, can get out of here, and those of you who want to stick around for Q&A at least have something to think about. So let's go to, to Genesis the early chapters of Genesis, and of course the, you know, the big action in chapter 6, but there's more than that, I think. Um, you know, by the time we get to the flood, people have many different opinions, and of course no one living today, um, except Christ himself, knows how many people were alive at the time of the flood, but... Um, it's been 1,656 years, according to Genesis 5. It's been almost 1,700 years since everything was created. And when you consider um, the type of environment that it was, when you consider how perfect, if you would, be, you know, I'm not diminishing sin, but how perfect the environment was um, and how prolific the environment was, uh, you can just begin to imagine just how prolific people were in terms of population growth. So um, it's very easy to conclude that anywhere from seven to eight billion people could have lived on planet Earth. And most of us, when we hear that number, we say, oh, come on. They were primitives. What do they know? Well, yes, they didn't have iPhones, as far as we know. Um, but what makes them a primitive? I think we have a caveman view of, of people back then, which really doesn't bear up under scrutiny. Um, so anyhow, the, you know, we can talk about that anytime you want to, but uh, so you have many, many people and God makes a decision uh, that he's gonna scrub the earth clean. In fact, he says in, um, let me see, um, beginning right around verse, oh, I guess it's right there. Um, the Lord says in, um, Verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man, this is chapter 6, verse 5, the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of man's heart were only evil all the time. Yikes. It doesn't impress you, I can tell. I mean, only evil all the time. That's how bad things were. And the Lord well, was sorry. It's just the translator is trying to deal with a weird verb in, in Hebrew, but he was, it, it, uh, it, it burdened the Lord greatly, as you could say, that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created. That includes men and women. I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry, or I'm, you know, heavy, heavy laden, that I have uh, made them. 
Interesting, it doesn't mention fish, so the presumption is that the fish somehow survived. That's only an assumption on my part. Uh, I, I find the, the, every time I come back to Genesis to start reading again, I love it more and more. It's still my favorite book uh, to read and to teach. I, the, I, you learn more all the time. And if you, the, the better you understand Genesis, the better you understand the rest of the Bible, and the better you understand the need for a creator. I mean, excuse me, obviously, but the need for a savior. Um, so, okay, so God's clearly very angry. What's going on? Why did this happen? Um, you know, if you could go back for a moment, I want to deal with a, a passage that most of us don't tend to think about when we think of the Nephilim. Or a passage most of us don't think about when we think of the devil. Or a passage we don't think about much when we think about the Antichrist. You wouldn't think the Antichrist is in Genesis, but he is. Actually, a number of places, but he's right here in the early chapters. And of course, you know the story in chapter three. The serpent was more cunning. It was just an amazing the more you study that in Hebrew, just how clever this, this being was, the serpent, the nachash in Hebrew, the shining one, the great shining one, the nachash is the great shining one. He's so, well, I'm not here to talk about the devil, but um, it's worth your study sometime to understand our adversary. As much as I do believe that it's important for Christians to study the truth, and then we'll understand wickedness, I do believe, I really do believe it's also important. I, felt, I know as a pastor, I need to also study my adversary. And um, it's important that we do that. Too often as Christians, we just say, oh, I don't care. Well, you ought to, because he's out for you. He's out for you. We think we're so together. Hey, I got money, or I'm young, and I'm strong. And I'm, yeah, wait, if, if you want to, wait. See what happens. Um, it's good to know your adversary. Anyhow, so we, we know the story, right? And basically, we know the story that um, the, the serpent spoke to Eve. Did God really say that you can't eat anything in the garden? Of course, he sets up the, the absolute falsehood for her to say, no, of course not. You know, God said we can eat whatever we want to, except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and not even touch it, which he hadn't said. But um, he said, we're not to do that lest we die. The day we eat of it, we shall die. You shall not surely die, he replies. By the way, did they die? And we all know the right answer, right? They died spiritually, right? But did they die? No, no, no. They didn't know eventually. You don't know eventually. Today, you don't know what tomorrow's going to look like. Did they die? No, they didn't die. So, I mean... I'm being a subtle, I'm using a subtlety because he's saying you will not surely die. When she ate it, did she drop dead? No. Did her husband drop dead? No. Right. So it's kind of interesting how he works. He takes an extreme, proves himself with that because they don't know all the rest of the truth. Anyhow, it's just an insight into the way the devil works. But in any event, go through that. You know the story. She gave some to her husband who was with her, which brings up lots of questions. And men, we should want to ask Adam someday, what, what was that? You were with her and you didn't stop her. Um, the eyes of both of them were open, verse 7. They realized they were naked, which means they were ashamed. Everything about them suddenly they realized was known and knowable. And so they hid themselves. And we know the rest and how God is walking um, seeking them out. He knows where they are, but Adam, where are you? And uh, the woman you gave me, <laughs> you know, she did this, uh, all that. But now we get to the curse, right? The curse. And th this is what I want you to look at. We understand the curse, you know, what, what the Lord says to the woman, what he says to Adam, but I want us to look at the serpent, what the Lord says to the serpent. And he said, Verse 14, Jehovah God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity, meaning constant warfare. Is that what that means? I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's not saying girls don't like snakes. That's not what he's saying. I'll put warfare. As much as you think you know this, pay close attention to what's being said here. I will put enmity, warfare, between you and the woman and between your seed 
and her seed. Between whose seed? I will put enmity between you, he's speaking of the serpent, I'll put enmity warfare between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. What seed? Whose seed is he speaking about? No, read it carefully. We all know to say Christ. Read the whole sentence. What does it say? I'll put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, same structure of the sentence, and between your seed, whose seed? The serpent's seed. The seed of the serpent. I'll put enmity, warfare, between you, the serpent, and she, the woman, and between your seed, the serpent's seed, and the woman's seed. Now, I mean, the thing I always talk about when I'm preaching, right, and we all talk about this, pastors always say this stuff, is that this is the first, you know, hint, it's the first prophecy of Messiah, that someone's going to come along, we read later on, going to crush the head of the serpent, right? Um, and, and it's the hint of right there of, of, of a virgin birth because women don't have seed. Women have eggs. Men have seed. So it's a weird thing to say. It's only accepted by um, Christians who think they know their Bible and been studying the Bible a long time and young children. Okay, they all, those are the ones who accept it. But the rest of the people are like, no, wait a minute. What's going on here? A seed? A woman has a seed? No woman doesn't have a seed. Then why would God say that? It's an interesting question, which we all should ask, because what is God saying? He's saying, certainly, of this, he's saying one is going to come from the woman who will be the Messiah. doesn't use that word, Messiah, but we can look backward and see that, right? You with me? Yeah. Okay. But what else is he saying to the serpent? Wait, the woman has seed, she doesn't, but there will be one who comes from the woman. And, and do we know how that happens? Where'd that come from? How, how, how does the woman produce someone who's going to crush the head of the serpent? How does that happen? You know the answer? Say it. The, the Holy Spirit, right? He'll come upon you, he says to, you know, Gabriel says to, to who? To Mary, <laughs> Right? The, and the, the power of God, the glory of the Most High will come upon you, and the one who will be born in you, conceived in you, is this one, right? But they didn't know that thousands of years beforehand. We know it, looking back thousands of years. But what I want us to get at, and it's so easy for us to slide right over, so don't lose it, don't miss it. What is it? The seed of the serpent. See, we always study, and rightly so. We want to study Messiah, because we should. He's numero uno. He's our man. He's the guy. He's the, he's the guy who saved us. We should want to study him. But we have an adversary. We don't like to talk about him, so we ignore him. I will put warfare, God says, between you, the serpent, and her, the woman, and your seed, the serpent's seed, and the woman's seed. What is that seed? The serpent's seed. Do you know? What, you got to speak louder. Is it the Nephilim? I'm just asking. Is it? What is it? Uh, I, do, you guys, do you guys see it? Is it in your Bible too? What do you guys see? Loud. No, someone else. What's that? No, no, no. What's that? Okay, that's an interesting point. Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. And they, no, doesn't actually tell us who they are. It's an interesting pronoun. They will mingle with the miry clay. Mire is dust. And clay, miry clay is clay made out of dust. It's like dead clay. That's weird. That's all we're told. But that's thousands of years from now. So what's he talking about? That's, see, there's a lot of speculation. Here's what I want you to get at. What I want us to get at is... He, who is God speaking to? He's speaking to the serpent about the woman. He's not speaking to the woman yet. He's speaking about the woman to the serpent. I'm going to put warfare between you and the woman, and I'm going to put warfare between your seed and her seed. What is his seed? What's the serpent's seed? I'm pushing you because we don't talk about it. And I'm not going to spend all night doing this, but I just, I'm just i not trying to waste time on purpose. I'm not, what I, what I want to get at is we don't spend enough time talking about it. So think about it. By the way, who is the Antichrist? 
Have you ever thought about who's the Antichrist? I don't mean what's his name, because people probably have a lot of opinions in this room. Uh, <laughs> but what? Who? What is this man? Clearly a man who, huh? A hybrid. Well, it's an interesting possibility. It's a very, very high possibility that there's some hybridedness, if that's an adjective, uh, or hybrid quality in this, uh, in this Antichrist. Because he is, in effect, you could say he's, he's about as far to that point as anyone will ever be or has ever been in terms of a man being under the power of the devil, right? Whether he's an actual hybrid, but it's an interesting question. And that's part of what I'm trying to push us to get at. We like things. Here's my point, really. Here's the point. Just get to the point, John. The point is that most of us just like things neat in a box. Neat in a box. Make it clear to me. I mean, I might wait too. I'm, I'm just saying we like things neat in a box. Tell me what it is. If I don't understand it, I'll just keep reading. And that's the way I've kind of gone through my Christian life, okay? But the more I come back to these things, the more I realize, no, there's a whole lot more cooking here than that. Because when God says, and this is probably the last time I'll say it, I'll put enmity between your seed, the serpent's seed, and the woman's seed, it begs the question, then what is the seed of the serpent? And it's okay, it's not wrong, in my opinion, to say the Antichrist. But is that the only event in human history where the seed of the serpent could be operative and against the seed of the woman? Because who, after all, is the seed of the woman? You know his name. His name is Jesus the Messiah. So if the seed of the woman is Jesus the Messiah, and he's been active in one form or another throughout all of history, most obviously since uh, year 1 AD or you know thereabouts, then the seed of the serpent is always the one who's always after Christ and everything that he represents or all the ways that he's, uh, he's made himself known in one form or another throughout all recorded history, not just during the history of the church on earth. But since we are a part of the church on planet earth, we ought to be concerned about that. But I don't like to be concerned about that. I want things neat and in a box. I don't want to think about risks. I don't want to think about people who want to kill me. I don't want to think, oh, do you? I don't want, I mean, I'd like to know ahead of time so I could avoid it, but I don't want to think about things that will be a problem in my life that some, somebody is bringing a threat against me. But that is a stated threat right there against anyone who follows Messiah Jesus. So it, but it brings up the question then, so what is this one who is the seed of the serpent? And for that matter, if that's some form of a hybrid, then, and I know I'm touching something very difficult here, so I'm not going to plow very deeply, but also then, who is Jesus? It's an interesting thing, because we're talking about someone, aren't we? Christ himself. Would you say he's God? Yes. Okay, good, good. That was good. Would you say he's also fully man? Yes. Hmm. That's an interesting combination. In fact, if there was ever a hybrid in history, that's it. Here's my point. I don't want to dig too deep on that one or drill too deep because that's going to get weird for a lot of us really quickly because we're also talking about the Nephilim. So don't get, don't get confused about what I'm saying here. But what I am saying is, Always remember, and those of you who've been to Israel with us, you know one of the things we talked about uh, when we're in Jerusalem especially and we talk about Islam, we're always talking about how the devil is the great imitator. Right? right? He's always imitating what God is doing. And on top of imitation, there seems to be some way in which in the spirit slash physical world that the greater spirits are able to interact with the material realm in a way that we tend not to want to think about. We just want to think everybody keeps their places. You stay over there. We'll stay over here. You know, doesn't work that way. That's not the way the devil works. And frankly, it's not the way God works, right? It's very interactive with us. All right, so 
Some of you are thinking, well, you know, I don't come to Wednesday nights much. This will probably be the last time. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me, I, I shouldn't do these things, but it, is, is this stirring anything up in you? Yeah. I didn't ask if it was good or not, but I just want to know if it's stirring anything up in you. All right. If you turn over to chapter four, you know what happens there, right? Uh, um, Adam and Eve had these two sons. By the way, they had other children too. Um, God, the Bible is God's, is his revelation of his plan to redeem mankind. Uh, you've probably known people who like to say, um, uh, why don't I find the history of these people in the Bible? Or why don't I find, you know, the discovery of gravity in the Bible? Or, you know, God's Bible is a great history book. Everything that he writes there is accurate. You can trust it, no matter what it's about. If he has it in his, in, in his book, it's accurate. It doesn't mean that he's written about every single thing that's happened on all over planet Earth. He doesn't do that. The things that he has written in, in the Bible are those things which, uh, which serve his primary purpose, which is what? To reveal to mankind his plan to redeem us out of sin, to buy us back, to redeem, to buy us back out of sin and to lead us into the kingdom. Not just heaven where we, we, we relax in big sofas, no, but, but to, and to lead us into the kingdom. He has a kingdom plan for us. And so, so w when he says that, you know, Adam and Eve, they had, that they had children, they had Cain first, you know, the, the Lord had, I've acquired a son from the Lord, she says, and I, so they named him Cain, and then they had the second son, Havel, Abel, and, um, well, it's not like they didn't have any other children. They had others. These are the ones that matter to the storyline, and that's the way it is with everything. That's why pe when people say, you know, uh, where did Cain get his wife? You know, we'll never trust the guy who was asking about someone else's wife in the first place. But um, it's because it wasn't relevant to the story. Probably married a cousin, and that's not as weird as you think, because in those days the, the bloodline wasn't corrupted. Anyhow, two men, Cain hates his brother because his sacrifice was not accepted by God, but his brother's was. And so he kills his brother, and God sends Cain and all of his family away. So you have a group of people. There's a lot going on in chapter 4 we're not digging into tonight. If you want to talk about it in the, in, you know, in, in, in the Q&A, we can do that. But I'm not going there tonight. Chapter 4 is a much more interesting chapter than a lot of people think. And so we see that Cain, Cain is sent out along with his family. Um, he's, he's ostracized, you could say, um, from the line. And uh, well, God, anyway, I'll leave that there. Um, but it says something very interesting in verse 26. It says, in those days, in the days of Enosh, um, it says, in those days, men began to call on the name of the Lord. That's a great statement. I mean, it's just like, praise the Lord. People began to call on the name of the Lord. Uh, but there are a number of people, a uh, number of scholars, I should say, uh, Kim, C Kim Shi, Rashi, Jerome, Maimonides, uh, and others. These are ancient, as in uh, Maimonides and Nachmanides were 100 years apart, but they're like, Maimonides is in the 12th century, Nachmanides was in the 13th century, a long time ago. Uh, they have a lot of valuable things to offer. And, and those two guys are also not Christians. They are, um, they're Jewish and they're mystical in their writings, but they have a lot to offer. In any event, both those guys, as well as Rashi and Jerome, they all make the point that there's a, there's a variant way of translating that verse. That's not a thing that most of us talk about, and, and we have a tendency to be suspect when we read that. Oh yeah, you say there's a variant translation. Yeah, I don't know. How come they didn't put it in my New King James Bible? Well, because I'm not gonna, we, if you guys wanna talk about translation, sometimes we can go into that. It's a very interesting topic, but for our purposes tonight, I'll just ask that you trust me that there are other ways of translating occasionally 
occasionally. There are other ways of translating certain verses based upon a given word. And there is a word here that is still in the sentence. And, and if I say it to you in Hebrew, it doesn't mean much to you. Halal. Say, okay, hello to you too. Um, but it's a, it's a verb that can mean to profane. So you can equally, they would say, you could equally translate that, that verse, in those days men began to profane the name of the Lord. Now, in, in one sense, that doesn't bother you that much. I mean, you, you don't like the idea of people profaning the name of the Lord, but how do you know and all that? What b- makes it interesting is when you look at what else is going on in those days. Because in those days are the same days that we see referred to in chapter 6. So we have chapter 1, creation. Chapter 2, kind of the overview of things. Now God gets specific and he talks about marriage and how he makes a woman for the man. And we see marriage instituted and then the fall of man in chapter 3. And then this whole mess that happens between Cain and Abel in chapter 4. Chapter 5, one of the greatest uh, chapters that people just skip right over in their reading because they say it's a genealogy. I don't read genealogies, people say. Uh, But there's a lot to be found there. We've gone over that before because it's a gospel presentation in chapter 5. And I'll tell it to you in the break if you ask. And then in chapter 6, now we have the reason why God is going to scrub the earth clean. It says in verse 1 that it came to pass. And what he's referring to here is the same time period, but just a little bit later, the same time period that he was referring to back in chapter 4. It came to pass, he says, in those days... When men, this is two verses are one sentence. It came to pass that when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and when daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now, there's a lot of they's and them's going on here. So what's happening? It says, it says what? Population growth, right? We got population growth happening. And during those days when population growth is happening in the days long before the flood, that a group called the Sons of God, not a Christian motorcycle gang, okay? <laughs> they used to worship down at Philly. They're still around. Not them. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. Who were daughters of men? Who were daughters of men? They're women, right? Women, a woman is is from a man, so it's a woman. Sons of God, whoever they are, saw the daughters of men, saw that they were beautiful, and they, who? The sons of God took wives for themselves of all whom they, who? The sons of God, of all whom they chose. Are we clear? I didn't make it up. It's in the Bible. What's happening? And how do you know? What's happening? And how do you know? Now, a lot of you, you know, maybe you've been through this before uh, and, and you've heard it. Let's review. Sons of God is a phrase you don't find often in the Bible. You will find it twice in Genesis you'll find it three times in Job. Let's just talk about Old Testament, because there, ref- there are a couple references, actually, in the New Testament, but that hasn't been written yet, right? So, so at that point, there are five references to the sons of God. Two in one book, three in another. It says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, liked them, and said, I'll take one or more. For myself. That's what they did. Now, there's a lot of questions that you may have, it doesn't give us answers to. Was it a willing? Were the women willing? No. Oh, is that what it says in your Bible? How do you know that? Huh? They took. Yeah. I mean, I took a woman as a wife. She seemed to be willing at the time. I'm, today, I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, here's my point be careful what you add on, okay? You could make the case, and I've made the case myself at times, that based upon the way the verb is in Hebrew, it seems like it could have been a violent, but it doesn't say that. It does not say that. 
Okay, let's not, let's not get ourselves into the weeds. What we know is someone referred to as the sons of God, and it's more than one because it's a plural. Saw daughters, that's a plural, and took them. So who were the sons of God? All right, so look, some of you already know this stuff, and maybe you even know how to argue it. But what's going on here, and how would one know? Two times we're, we see it referred to in, in, in Genesis, but let's deal with Job, because three times in Job we read the phrase, sons of God. Uh, we see it in uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Job. We read there that uh, when the sons of God came before the Lord at the, uh, at, at the, uh, you know, in, in heaven, they had, to, they had to make report before the Lord, um, and Satan was with them, okay? They all have to make report, so don't think they're all evil, okay? They had to make report. So who, who are sons of God? Seems to be angels. Now wait, that's super icky. Right? That's super icky. Because that means you think that angels did this. Angels did this, right? Well, who else could it be? So some people would propose that actually it was the line of Seth. Remember, Cain was sent out. Um, and that it was actually the men from the line of Seth. They were godly because they, you know, they were not sent out, the people will propose. And that they saw the daughters of the Canaanites, not Canaanites, of the, of the, of the descendants of Cain. And they said, hmm, good looking. And they, they said, let's take them as wives. And a lot of problems with that. But that's what some people want to say. Actually, up until the fourth century, that's a long time, right? Throughout all of Hebrew history, and then 400 years of church history, it was universally understood by Jewish sages as well as Christian sages that these were angels. That these were angels in their human embodiment. Or, you know. And you see that a lot, don't you, in scripture? Where, remember uh, chapter 18 of Genesis? That uh, two angels and the Lord himself came to Abraham's tent and Abraham made them dinner or lunch, you know, said, hey, rest, take a load off, and, and fed them. So not only were these angels there looking like men, and the Lord too, looking like a man, right? But they ate human food. Angels can apparently eat human food. There's a lot of evidences of that. And even that humans can eat angels' food. We read that a couple different places in Scripture. Anyhow, I'm not going to go into those weeds right now, but, uh, <laughs> but they can. So, I will make the case, because that's the way I see it in the interest of time, and you can ask me later, but I'll say, these are angels who chose in a human form to take woman, women. And um, now what does it say? It says, the sons of God, verse, verse 2, saw the daughters of men, saw that they were fair, and took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. The Lord said, verse 3, my spirit will not contend with man forever, or to strive with man forever, for uh, he's, he is indeed flesh, or he's mortal. Uh, his days shall be 120 years. In other words, God's putting the world, basically, on, on, on alert. You have that much time left before everything goes away. Then it says, now, depending upon your, your translation, if it's King James or New King James, it's going to say there were giants in those days. If you have NIV, ESV, NAS, uh, actually most of the other translations, it says the Nephilim, because that's what it says in Hebrew. So they just transliterated it from, from the Hebrew. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and then follow it, whether it says giants or Nephilim. Let's go with Nephilim for, for a moment, because that's what it says in the Hebrew. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, that ought to disturb you, also when? Afterward. When, in other words, this is an explanation of how it happened. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. What days? The days before the flood. They were in the, on the earth in those days, days before the flood, and also afterward, write a big question mark over that. What does that mean? The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when... In other words, here's the explanation. When the sons of God, those angels, came into the daughters of men 
and bore children to them. These were the men of, of old, men of renown, mighty men, the Gibberim. Uh, okay, so who are the Nephilim? Who are the Nephilim? They're the offspring of a union. They're the offspring of a union between angels and women. That's, that's what the text says, okay? I'm not selling it, I'm telling it. I'm just telling you what it says. It's weird. It's, it ought to be really disturbing for you. If you find it interesting or like, ooh, this is cool, you probably need to rethink what you watch late at night, okay? But this is, this is really creepy. But it says, the Nephilim, who also were giants, that's not why it's translated that way. That, we can talk about that some other time. But they were. The Nephilim. So who are the Nephilim? They are the offspring. They're the product. They are giant. They are monstrous. I mean, you can have two people get married and their kids may be kind of monsters, but that doesn't mean they're monstrous. I mean, this is a whole different kind of problem. Okay. So... The reason we're dealing with this is because we started by t saying, well, what's the deal with aliens? What's the deal with UFOs? What's the deal with these sightings? What's the deal with ETs and, 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 and talk, people's comments about abductions? What's the deal with that? Is there a biblical explanation, right? That's the, hopefully that's the reason you came. That's that's what we need to look at here. And yeah, we've talk, taken a lot of time to go through all this just so that we have it together because while we don't have the answers to it all, we have a phrase, first of all. Number one, we have an explanation of what happened in the days before the flood. We also have a statement that it not only happened in the days before the flood, it also happened afterward, but it doesn't tell us when afterward was. Can you think of times when we see this in scripture, can, can you, where, where are times we see this in scripture? After the flood. A Joshua, Joshua and Caleb and the other 10 spies come back and the 10 spies give the wicked report, right? And everybody goes along with them, but they all agreed, Joshua and Caleb and the 10, they all agreed, we saw the Nephilim in the land. And we were as grasshoppers in their sight and also in our own. By the way, do you remember what they brought back with them from the promised land? What did they bring back with them? Grapes. Yeah, a nice little bunch of grapes, right? <laughs> it was an enormous, I mean, these grapes must have looked like cantaloupes, each one of them, because it took two men to carry this thing on their shoulders. I mean, yes, there was, it was productive from a farmland standpoint in, in Canaan, but it suggests that there was something else going on this only that's only conjecture but it suggests that there was something else going on something big I I, 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 I I hate to say giant but there's a suggestion for that okay so so we have that or can you think of other times in the Old Testament reading where, where Goliath how tall was he 10 feet tall this is 10 feet Ew. you know he's 10 feet tall he's a he's a son of Anak Anak means giant. That's literally what it means in Hebrew. And, and so the Anakim, in fact, if you look uh, real quick, look over in uh, chapter 14, 14 and 15, but we read about the, um, the Imim, the Zanzumim. I mean, they're creepy guys, but I love the name. Um, we also, uh, actually, uh, chapter 15, we see uh, the Kinim, the Kenazim, in, in verse 19, uh, the Hittites, Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites, these all had a giant aspect to them. Um, in, um, some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, we've never done it on a tour, on our 2.0 tour, we're going to do it. But up uh, on the eastern side of the, uh, of the Sea of Galilee, you know, it's a mountain and then it's a plateau up there. It's also known as the Bashan. Okay, so remember, can you think of anybody who came from the Bashan? Og, the king of Bashan, right? Um, his bedstead was 13 feet long. 
Um, he was a giant, and, and none of these Israelites could go in up against them. God sent in hornets to drive them out. Um, it doesn't matter how big you are, a hornet's going to get you out of there. And, but there was something else up there. Do you know what is up there now? It's a place, some people call it the circle. It's called Gilgal Rephaim. Rephaim means the dead ones. They were giants, but there was something wicked and there was a deadness that people attributed to them. There's a, there, there's a five concentric circles of rock. You can't even see it when you're up next to it. It just looks like a wall. You can see it from a drone or from some sort of aircraft. You can look down at these concentric circles that each one of these stones weighs easily 10 to 15 tons put in place. By whom? There were no cranes back then. How did this stuff happen? I mean, anyhow, so you have this activity that was going on in Canaan land before the Israelites got there. You remember what God said to Abraham in chapter 15 of Genesis? He said, this land I'm going to give to your descendants, not you, but to your descendants. First, you, your descendants will go down into a land, not your own, which we find out to be Egypt, right? And you'll stay there as slaves for 400 years. Then I will bring you out with a, a, a mighty right hand, right? I will bring you out, and then you will drive out, you will destroy those living in the land, in this land, Canaan, but not yet, he said, because the sin of the Amorites, the people living in that land, are not yet full. God's saying, I'm going to destroy this wickedness. Kind of like he said, I was going to destroy, he said he was going to destroy all of the living beings on the earth with a flood. I'm going to destroy all these people with your descendants, Abraham. But not yet, because their sin isn't full yet. So, you know, God gets this bad rep. Have you noticed? All the deconstructionists who want to say, you know, God is just this bloodthirsty, wrathful God. He's out. And look, I, I know he's not. You know he's not. But think of it the way you would have thought about it before you were born again. You would have said, yeah, yeah, that's, man, that's weird. Why does he do that stuff? Because they don't know the rest of the story. Because something wrong. It's not cancer. It's not a broken arm. Something that has to do with the image of God in mankind that was corrupted by the devil. That's what happened in the days before the flood. You have to deal, we, we don't like to, we want to skip over it, but we got to deal with that verse that says, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, days before the flood, and also afterward. Afterward, so we just looked at two examples, three examples, right? There are a lot more, I would contend that you can understand the whole Old Testament without knowing this stuff, but when you do, it's like, woo, the lights are on. Now you're understanding a whole lot more. In fact, Jude talks about it. Peter talks about it. Peter, in his second epistle, he refers to angels who left their first, he says, their, their first habitation. But he left their, their first estate to do what they did. God says, or Peter says that God has put them in, your Bible probably says, in hell. It's not hell like the lake of fire. It's a place, it's the only place in the Bible you ever find this, this word, Tartarus. Tar, T-A-R, T-A-R-U-S, Tartarus. And no one really knows what it is. The only answer you get to that question is found in Greek mythology. Homer, in his Iliad, says that Tartarus is as far below Hades as earth is below heaven. Ooh, that's, I don't want to go there. <laughs> that's a bad place. And it's reserved for one type of being, the angels who disobeyed and did this thing. You say, well, why doesn't God just stop them? Why doesn't he stop them from doing this? I don't know. If, if, if that's your argument, you want to just say, God probably stopped them, then how are you going to explain all these other things? In fact, I would say, only my opinion. But end time prophecy, prophecy about the return of the Lord, yeah, you can understand Jesus is coming back. We can all understand that. But there's a lot more here that we won't understand without fully unless we understand this. What did Jesus say? Let me read this and we'll, and, and we'll pray, okay? Jesus said this. He said, the days are going to come. I'm reading from Luke chapter 17, but just listen along. 
The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you won't see it. They will say to you, look here or look there. He said, don't go after them. Don't follow them. For just as lightning flashes from one part under heaven uh, to the other, so the Son of Man will be in his day. But first, the Son of Man must suffer many things and must be rejected by this generation as it was in the days of Noah. And we have a hint of that now. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they, uh, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. You can read that as Things were just normal, and then suddenly came the destruction. That's true. But also, things operated as normal, and they accepted all that horror that was going on all around them. That's the way, the, what they accepted in the days before the flood. That's what they accepted in the day before you know, God rained down fire and brimstone uh, on, on Sodom. That's what's happening in our own society right now. As wicked as it gets... It's situation normal for everybody else. Suddenly, it's going to change. You're asking the question, but John, didn't you start by talking about all these UFOs and all that stuff? So why did you do that? Was that just like brain candy to get us in here? Like, what was the point? <laughs> yes and no. To make the case that we have to understand what happened in the days before the flood. Because when he says there also afterward. Certainly Moses, who's writing it, is talking about what he even saw afterward. It wasn't just, um, it wasn't just what the spies saw. They saw giants among the Amorites and, and the others as they traveled from Egypt through those 40 years. They saw those things. When they went up against Og, king of Bashan, they saw the giants. He understood that. Moses didn't live in the days that you and I are living right now. But Jesus warned us that as it was, so shall it be. There's a reason I brought up cattle mutilations. There was a reason I brought these things up. There's a reason I mentioned people who've been abducted, who talk about the types of procedures that were done on them. One can start to put those things together with what we read about in the days before the flood. The technology, I don't know how it works. I just know that I can trust God when he describes it. And so can you. And we ought not to take it lightly. And as Jesus said, it's over and over and over and over again in Matthew 24, Matthew 25, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21. See that you are not deceived. See that you, he said, in fact, had the, at the time not be shortened, even the very elect would be deceived. May we not be deceived. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God. Um, I, so, so first of all, I'll just stay, and if someone wants to understand it better, we can talk about it. But the sons of God that are referred to in Genesis chapter 6 are angels. Now, Joe just added something that I would not add. Uh, no, I mean, just so we're clear. The Bible doesn't say they were kicked out of heaven. So they were, um, they were angels. And I would say, you know, they weren't, there's two groups of angels, right? There's, there's God's righteous angels, and then there are the wicked angels. And uh, who's walking in here with a foil hat on? Okay. Yeah. Leave it to the Jewish guy to be the funny man, you know? Okay. <laughs> All right, so, um, so there, there are two groups of angels. There are two groups of angels. There are the righteous angels, and there are uh, the wicked angels. And the wicked angels appear to be outnumbered two to one. Um, so it, it, it's a reasonable conclusion that the, the sons of God, the angels who did this thing in Genesis chapter 6, were Satan's followers, okay? Uh, and they... They had chosen to do this. Um, the reason, in fact, let me, let me show it to you, but in, in 
2 Peter chapter 2, uh, he says there that... Um, Verse 4, for if God, chapter 2 of 2 Peter, verse 4, for if God did not spare angels who sinned, meaning that kind of a sin, um, but cast them down to Tartarus and delivered them into chains of darkness reserved for judgment. Um, so he did that. They're, they're not there because they're wicked angels. They're there because as wicked angels, they did this thing. So it's a whole other thing. Um, and it's a, what it says, you don't see it in English. It says they left their first habitation. That's one way it's said in English. Um, I think in King James, it says they left their first estate, but anyhow, they left what they left, what they should have been in terms of their, their physical being. They left that in exchange for looking like a man, being a man and engaging in this, this activity. That's the thing for which God has punished them. Um, they left their first, uh, more information you need, they left their okaterion is the Greek word. You find that two times in the New Testament. One, in terms of angels, and also in 2 Corinthians 5, speaking of us, that we have an okaterion. This is our tent. It's our okaterion, and we will, we will receive and put on a new okaterion, a new habitation for our soul. Um, so anyhow, that's what it says about them. I was just kind of curious. Was, was they have a, do they have a limited lifespan? Angels live yeah. forever. Yeah, well, then if there may be a Nephilim. A Nephilim, does that have a lifespan? Well, there's a, big, there's a very pregnant question. Um, this is, he, he got two questions. Just because he gets two doesn't mean everybody else does. <laughs> we have an agreement. He's going to pay me for the second question later. But... Um, uh, but it's a very, it's an important piece because the question always comes up, what is a demon? All right. So you have two classes of angels. Okay. Uh, aside from seraphim, cherubim and all that, you have good angels, bad angels, right? Okay. Um, and then, so you have good angels and bad angels and angels will be judged. The, the wicked angels will be judged one day, right? The hell Lake of Fire was created for, for Satan and his, and his angels, right? So, um, so then we come across this word later on in terms of God's history. Um, we come across this word, the spirits or demons. We especially see that in the New Testament or, you know, New Testament and the Gospels. All right, so what's a demon? We have a tendency, we all have this tendency to do this. We call uh, fallen angels, we call them demons. They're not. An angel... Good or bad, a good or bad angel is still an angel. Well, what does that mean? It means, in short, I mean, they have this ability to be invisible to us. They, they're in this room, the Bible says. They are here right now, but you don't see them. But they also can be visible and very tangible. Paul says in chapter 13 of Hebrews that, that we're to um, show hospitality to strangers so because many have entertained angels without knowing it, right? Um, so, and, and we see that, like I mentioned uh, Genesis chapter 18 earlier about Abraham entertaining, you know, showing hospitality to the angels and the Lord when they came feeding them and they ate. So they, they do very physical things. All right, so what's a demon then? So it appears, and it's conjecture, but it's a, I think it's a reasonable one, that is that um, when the flood occurred, God destroyed all living beings, including the Nephilim, you know, who are the offspring of this intermarriage, right? But that the, um, the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, for whatever reason, are not welcome in Hades, where people go when they die, right? Um, they're not welcome there. Where do they go? They roam the earth. They don't appear as men, okay? They're spirits. What they want is to occupy a host body. And we can see from the scripture that, you know, a pig is just as good as a man. Remember when, when Jesus cast out the, 
the demons from that man, from the demoniac, and they went into the pigs. So that's the difference between a fallen angel and a, and a demon. And so it, just to kind of bring this around, so when you talk about UFOs, what are these things if they're actually physical craft of some sort? And people have said that they have, they have found um, non-human biologics in, uh, in these crashes. Well, what are those things? Well, they're not demons because demons are spirits. So it appears to be whether a Nephilim type of thing or, um, or, or they're fallen angels who you know, are in some form or another. So, I mean, it's speculation. You get to a certain point, which uh, for those of you who, you know, you weren't in our conversation earlier, but Tito asked the question, well, then you know, why is Satan doing this? I mean, if, 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 if everything that he, that he created, so to speak, got wiped out before the flood, I mean, he's pretty smart. He knows everything that's going on for the most part, you know. Um, why would he do it again? Well, I don't know. I don't know why he would do it again. All I can say is we see pattern. And, and we continue to see a pattern. And by the way, uh, even though the devil does know all these things, uh, he tends to use a lot of the same logic. You know, the logic that he used with Eve is the same logic that he uses to entice people to sin today, you know? He's not all that creative in that regard. I'm not trying to mock him. I'm just saying that it would appear that way. So uh, another question. Uh, I, so I'll get to you over there. Yeah, your name, please. Hi, my name is Aisha. Good to see you. Okay. It is what it is. You know, it's just yeah. Just a thought. So, in the book of Enoch, it kind of expands upon what we're seeing here mm-hmm. in Genesis yes. 6. And I've read that, and it talks about the angels that cause men to sin in all kinds of ways. Mm hmm. Leviticus says what? I didn't hear that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. Uh, I don't know if you, you guys over there heard. Okay. So, um, I, it's an interesting conjecture or question. Uh, of course, I don't know. Um, and um, it is interesting, though, in in that regard, in terms of dinosaurs, because uh, you know dinosaurs were a real thing. Uh, even though a lot of people, I don't understand why, not you, but why some Christians don't seem to get that. Some some Christians seem to think that dinosaurs didn't exist and that was an evolutionary uh, idea. It's not. They're, they're in the Bible. We talked about that when we were in our Job study. Um, so, uh, and I'm trying to find something quickly in Job because toward the end of Job, of course, um, when, uh, you know, he... Uh, He speaks at the end in chapter 41 about Leviathan. And um, Leviathan, the way he's described there, of course, is a, we would say in our terminology, a fire-breathing dragon. Um, And uh, some people have trouble believing that, but of course, here it is right in the Bible, he calls him Leviathan. But as as you examine Leviathan, Leviathan is a, is not the devil, but but like God does in other parts of Scripture, uh, he does this in, in Isaiah, he does it in Ezekiel, where he, he talks about Satan through the lens of some other world leader at the time, the king of Tyre or the king of Sidon, or, you know, he, he does that. And so he uses that same 
liter I'll call it a literary device, okay? He uses that same literary device, if that's all it is. When he talks about Leviathan, he talks about Leviathan as the, the serpent, the true serpent, the real serpent that he is, but he also speaks of Leviathan through the lens of Satan, or th speaks of Satan through the lens of Leviathan. Um, so it's not the same thing that you're saying, but it's an interesting point. I, uh, there's nothing that I can really think of beyond that. Like, yeah, I could be wrong. Maybe someone else has an idea, but um, that I can think of in Scripture, Scripture as opposed to the Book of Enoch. Because the Book of Enoch, just so we all, I don't know who has and who hasn't read the Book of Enoch, but it's a very interesting book. And it's quoted, at least it seems to have been quoted, by Jude and by Peter, um, at least maybe somewhere else. But, um, and yet, it's not included in the canon for a reason. And I suspect part of the reason is that there are some things mentioned in Enoch, I can't think of which right now, but uh, that were not accurate. So it's not inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it's a very interesting book. Uh, so going back to your point about you know, the things that uh, the angels taught man, uh, I don't see something in scripture, e even though there's the, you know, the warnings against bestiality and those types of things. Um, I don't see an area in scripture that talks about um, large animals, an giant animals having been created through some weird uh, interunion uh, between angels and animals. Um, although I can't, can't help but say those things go through my mind when I think of cattle mutilations and some of these other things. So it's an interesting point because I don't think the devil doesn't seem to leave anything alone. He doesn't seem to leave anything alone. So I just don't know that I can support it with scripture. You know what I'm saying? And if I can't support it with scripture, then I, it, as much as it's enticing, it's not supported by scripture. So you know, I don't tend not to go there. So, but it's an interesting point. Very really is. Yes. Sure. Animals yeah. In the park, and you know, a lot of right. people have confirmed. Mm -hmm. so who knows where those animals yeah. come from? Yeah. So my question before oh. that was, please. <laughs> um, I do not believe in the missing link. You know, um, my daughter got me for Christmas last year, uh, 23 and Me, and I just found out that's mm. from China. But they say that I have a a very Yeah. Are you worried that you got Nephilim blood in you? Is that what you're getting at? <laughs> no, I'm trying to figure out where, where you're going. I just wonder where, you know, how true, you know, oh. all that stuff. I didn't want it, but it was a gift. Yeah. No, it doesn't matter. I did 23 and me too. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm Polish too. Yeah. Uh, you know, I... So look, look, don't worry about it. Don't, the fact that you did it, that's okay. You know, I mean, but now you're in some, you and I are both in this big genetic database somewhere. And they're coming for us. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> so I wouldn't worry about it. Mark, I'll come back. Yeah. So, so what's the UFO connection? Is that another world activity as opposed to extraterrestrial? So you asked what's the UFO connection? Right. Well, so it's, this is conjecture, right? I mean, uh, what, what, as I said earlier, you have to deal with the observation of, of uh, the, the observation of UFO sightings, the observation, meaning, you know, seeing the data of um, people who claim to have been abducted and what they say under hypnosis, those types of things. That observation, read the scripture as it was, so shall it be. It was an interesting uh, uh, combination of ideas to, to try to put together. Um, so, and I get lost in who, who was talking, we're talking about demons and, and fallen angels just now. So you've got, there's always, or for many of us, there's been this idea that 
UFOs appear to be demonic. And I would, you know, having thought more about this, studied more about it in recent years, I would say, no, it's not demonic. It more, more literally or more, more precisely, I would say, it's fallen angel or it's a Nephilimistic, if, I, if I'm making up adjectives right and left here tonight, but it's a Nephilim type of thing. Um, because what existed before the flood, what existed was the devil making an effort to, to create his own race, to create his own race. And maybe it was because he was outnumbered two to one and he wanted to you know, change the, I mean, I don't know, that's just conjecture. But, um, but to create his own race, and he, uh, uh, and he appeared to try to accomplish that by, um, by messing, not just messing with biology, but he messed with the image of God in man. That's why God wiped things out. Not just because of some nasty, icky thing that the devil did. The nasty, icky thing he did was to, um, was to mar the image of God in man. One of the uh, bibliography uh, uh, entries there is a book by Doug Hamp, Douglas Hamp, uh, called Corrupting the Image, because I think he gets at the point there. Anyhow, so to your question, it would appear to me that the devil is trying to do a couple of things. That's only my opinion. I don't know what the total end game is. I'm just, I'm just an observer like anybody else. So as an observer, I look at it and see what the devil did once before. He appears in one sense to be doing it again by perhaps creating another another entity or and, you know group of entities that we'll call like a nephilim type of thing they don't have to be giants you know just they were giants doesn't mean they're going to be giants number one um hmm? uh, okay so um yeah i don't yeah but using or, or manipulating our dna but in any event doing something like that i think the other thing though that sometimes we we miss out on we, meaning we don't think about is that the devil's, the devil's pitch to human beings always is, Jesus is just another way. It's just, he's just another of a lot of ways, but I have the better way. And, um, and I believe that that's the pitch that's happening to mankind right now. And I really do believe that we're, we, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I think we're not just Christians, but the rest of mankind currently is living under a shroud. We don't really, we can't tell what's about to happen. But what's about to happen, and of course I don't know when, but I do believe part of it has to do with the rapture. But I believe that even before the rapture, this will begin to be unveiled. And that is to, to say to mankind, there is a better way than this narrow way of thinking you know, that the Christians have. A better way than Judaism, a better way. And you know, Buddhism has its good way and Islam has its good way. When we think of you know, who the devil is and, and what the great delusion is going to be. I, I say that because let me read this to you. Um, you know, we all went through a time in our recent history in America, we saw a delusion that, uh, that people were willing to put themselves under. And I think it's, it seems to me that it's, it's happening now and it's going to happen in spades momentarily. It says that, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, now, brothers, considering, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if it came from us as though the day of Christ had already come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come until, unless the falling away comes first, and that the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and all that is worshipped so that 
he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So what's all that to say? That the great delusion, in fact, he'll make mention of that in a moment, that great delusion that's about to come on mankind will happen concurrent with the Antichrist, because that's what he's referring to here. When the Antichrist reveals himself, he's not going to say, I'm the devil, worship me. He's going to exalt himself above and in opposition to all that is God and all that is worshipped as God. That's everything. That's every possible religion in the world. That's crystals. That's everything that people worship in any way, shape, or form. So what does a UFO have to do with it? Well, I think what a lot of what it has to do with without getting into you know, panspermia and those ideas that people believe, you know, that aliens you know, uh, uh, populated the earth once before, that's probably going to come back in, in terms of the, you know, I, I believe that um, ETs will come back and say, we did that. We were the ones who brought you know, humanity on planet Earth. We have the better way. We've, you know, we've seen the things that you've done as human beings, and you've got yourself in a... In, deep, deep yogurt. You know, you're in a lot of trouble here on planet Earth, but we have the better way. And uh, at the rate we're going, I, I, I'm of the opinion that that will be welcomed. You know, I mean, and to, to tie that off, he says, um, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, the Holy Spirit, then that he who now restrains will continue to restrain until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, all signs, and all lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they didn't receive the love of the truth so that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. He'll send them strong delusion uh, so that they'll believe the lie. Uh, I think it's all part of a setup for the great lie. It's not like there's one particular end game to a UFO. I think it's part of a whole assortment of weapons that the enemy's bringing. And I, b I really do believe that the things that are coming on planet Earth and to humanity uh, are so deceptive. Again, like Jesus said, had the time not be shortened, even the very elect would be deceived. So I hope that helps. Charles. Not so much a question, but a thought. The Bigfoot, which is supposed to be like 10 feet tall. Did you say Bigfoot? Bigfoot, yeah. Could be a My son's got size 18 I, shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And always, almost not always, but a lot of times, UFO uh, phenomena is, is connected with that. Yeah. So I don't know yeah, I think that, no, it's true. Crazy. You'll li you'll like blurry creatures if you're into Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah. You'll definitely will. Ruth. I watch very little television, but this week I happened to be flipping and I found the History Channel, and it was all about interviewing the uh, children of those who were at Roswell. Hmm. About what? Oh, well. They hid a lot of evidence that nobody was allowed to talk about. It was great secrecy. When Roswell happened in, uh, was that June or July of 1948? 49? Um, huh? 48 or 49. But anyhow, uh, when that happened, uh, it immediately went on, you know, the technology of the day, you know. <laughs> little TVs and um, you know, big cabinets, little screens. And everybody saw it, they heard it on the radio, that a flying disc had crashed outside of the city of Roswell. I've been there. Um, had to go. Um, <laughs> John and I took off one Sunday afternoon. He was going to college. I said, you're not going on a road trip without me. And uh, so we drove straight on out to Roswell, New Mexico. 1947, okay. And, um, and we got there, and uh, we had lunch at the uh, Cover Up Cafe. And um, <laughs> uh, you know what? This is Americana. But anyhow, uh, 
But no, it, uh, it crashed somewhere outside of town. Look, I don't believe every story I hear, but, but the interesting thing about Roswell is that it happened, or, or whatever happened, happened. And uh, it went out as national news that, um, that a flying disc had been uh, recovered at the crash site and that four victims were found in it. Um, that was, uh, there was an Air Force base nearby Roswell. I, I forget how far, but not far away from Roswell. And um, the following day, I believe it was a brigadier general um, in uh, somewhere, I think Dallas or Fort Worth, um, said, no, actually, uh, he had it all wrong, that the, you know, the, the, the commander of the Air Force Base uh, near Roswell had it all wrong. Uh, it actually was a, just a silly mistake. It was a, it was a weather balloon uh, and its um, navigation disk that had crashed. They know there are no victims, and so nothing to see here type of thing. Um, the interesting thing, by the way, is that, um, look this up yourself, but um, with our modern technology where we can reconstruct you know, graphics from long ago, uh, you can actually reconstruct the, the papers, that the, the, the Brigadier General, I think he was General, uh, but he was holding, you can actually reconstruct what, what is said in the headlines. It speaks about a craft, that the craft that will be shipped you know, to whoever was getting it, I guess to the Smithsonian, because they get everything. Um, and uh, so anyhow, it was a lie. But, but the point is that they, they tried to say nothing to see here. Um, to this day, uh, Roswell remains fully classified. So if there was nothing to see, why is it classified, of course, is the question. Um, it, that was a very busy time uh, right after the Second War, and, and anybody who knows anything about, you know, uh, Air Force, you know, or, uh, you know, the uh, Air Force, the Air Force pilots, um, during the Second War, you, you hear about the Foo Fighters and, you know, those uh, who the, the French and also the Americans saw um, UFOs flying in formation with them. Uh, but after the Second World War, there was a lot of UFO activity in the United States. In fact, it was Washington National Airport. Dulles didn't exist at the time. But Washington National Airport had a lot of uh, UFO sightings in those two weeks following Roswell. Um, and every time that we would scramble fighters, fighters to get up and to, and to see what was going on, they were gone. And then after we landed, they would come back. This went on for um, a number of weeks. Uh, you know, like, you can, you can say people are mistaken in terms of what they say they saw, but you can't be mistaken in terms of what you see on radar. You know, so it, it, there was a lot of interesting stuff going on, but so that's what I think about Roswell. Something happened. Uh, yes, I'll go back to you, Helen. What do you think about Skinwalker Ranch? What do I think about what? Skin, I'm not familiar with Skinwalker Ranch. It's out in Utah. Okay. Uh, well, Utah. A fabricated show or, uh, you know, some Couldn't tell you. I know nothing about it. Yeah, sorry. Helen. Yeah. Well, I yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to be flip, so but yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. So. You would think, right? Right. And yet, at the same time, uh, those who've had encounters, like you know, if you go back and look at some of the naval uh, pilots and much of what they've encountered in the last ten years, these tic tac, they say tic tac shaped objects. Um, uh, they're dealing with a real thing. The question where it goes is a good great question. But even how they, they go from flying in, in the atmosphere to into the water without any apparent effect on the craft itself. It's a, it, you know, 
Yeah. Yes, back there. I'm sorry. Can you speak? Yeah, Charles. What's that? No, I'm talking to you. Come on. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a question. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are on these reports of increase in demonic uh, possession. Uh, like on demonic possessions, did you say? Like specifically, like they're talking about a lot of it's particularly like with homeless people out in California. Mm. Well, uh, uh, hold on. Rewind so I can understand the second question better. Okay. So my question is, what are your thoughts on the Antichrist possibly being some sort of like a demon spirit that is like been reincarnated, um, ah. like, you know, every generation to be ready, hmm. like to be some sort of, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, either like descendant of like the Nephilim spirits mm. or resurrecting, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then these other things that possess, so I don't know, is that like him not being fully human himself, but being some sort of... Uh, mm -hmm. No, it's, that's very interesting. Um, what we know about uh, the Antichrist is that he is a man. Uh, we know that the devil will empower him, that the devil will perform great lying signs and wonders uh, in general, but also through that man. So it's the devil's power doing it. Um, as to whether he's, uh, I know, you know you're just using, trying to figure out how to put it, you know, a reincarnation type of thing. Um, whether he's a, a, a regeneration of someone from long ago. I mean, the, Bi the Bible's silent on that. So it, it, it would only be like, eh, yeah, interesting, you know. Um, uh, but I think the, what matters is that in terms of the Antichrist, um, the devil doesn't know when the time is. So he has to be ready at every time. Now that means that he has always had someone ready. That means there's someone right now who is that man when the devil finds out that it's his turn to move. He's got to be ready with that person. Um, whether that person is uh, somehow Nephilim or something else, I don't know. But circling back to the first part of the study tonight, God says to the serpent that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And so who is the seed of the serpent? Well, ultimately, he's Antichrist. But... Um, could be a lot of other things as well. So, but now let's, that was your second question. Your first one, what had to do with possessions? Yeah, yeah that's a topic that uh, a lot of people don't want to talk about, but I think we should. So I think, um, we, because here's, here, we all operate with this belief. I, I suspect that in this room, we operate with the belief, greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world, right? So I'm safe in Christ. And you are, we are. Um, and, and the problem is what we start to do then, and we start to play word games and say, well, we can't be possessed, but we can be oppressed, you know, that, and which is true. You know, I can't be possessed by the devil, but I can be harassed. I can be oppressed. Um, and then what does that look like? How does that manifest? Hmm, some pretty lousy ways. But um, I do believe that this is a topic that the church in general is not ready for. Um, and I've heard enough reports. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, follow Jan Markell and, um, and, and that whole group, uh, Mark, uh, Mark, Mark. Mark Henry, yeah. 
not Hitchcock, Mark Henry and, um, and Jen Markell do a lot of work together. And you get a chance, follow them. But uh, they did have someone on a couple months ago talking about this very topic. And I think it's one that we don't talk enough about. There are many, I don't know about in this room, but um, many, especially with young children, we have to be so careful about what our children, what we're allowing our children to watch, listen to, read. Uh, the schools are no longer our friends in terms of, you know, what's, what our children are, you know, taking in uh, through their eye gate, their ear gate, what they're studying, what they're being told is right. Um, and, and parents seem to just go along in many cases with it. And what we don't necessarily put together is the idea that we allow our children then to be exposed to some of this great darkness um, and then they sit in their room with their device or whatever the case may be. And it's like, there, there's so many wicked places that they can go where the, their friends can go. Or, you know, what happens when my child goes over to, you know, a friend's house and what are they being exposed to? I might try. What I'm saying is that stuff is real. And uh, it, it doesn't mean that adult Christians are exempt from that harassment. But I, what I'm trying to get at is that children especially are easy pickings, easy pickings for the enemy. Um, and we need, to, we need to hold them in prayer. We need to be active in their lives, really talking with them. Uh, because it, it seems to me that as far as end game for the devil, he knows his time is short. So he's, gonna do, he's not just waiting around to find out when he can get his man in there to be Antichrist. He's, he's, he's moving every direction he possibly can. There's a reason he has so many fallen angels and how he uses demons uh, in order to address all lives, Christian and otherwise. Just because we're Christian doesn't mean we're exempt from that harassment. Did, did that help to kind of get at what you were getting at? Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm the opinion that UFOs are a deception. I mean, well, but let me go back. They are real. Deception. A real deception. <laughs> they're, they're real, but the deception is in what they are. Um, I, I would have trouble accepting that the science supports or that the Bible supports that there are, um, we'll call them civilizations, for lack of a better word, uh, on other planets in our solar system or on solar systems within our galaxy. So the Bible doesn't support that? I don't see where it does. Uh, primarily what I see is that Genesis 1 verse 26, God says, let us now make man in our image. Um, we have the one book that reveals God's plan to redeem mankind um, and is silent on the possibility of there being some other, civil, lack of a better word, civilization somewhere else. One can, and, I, I, and I've, I've gone down this road with people before who say, well, just because the Bible doesn't say that doesn't mean they don't exist. Yeah, it's like saying I could calculate the probability of all the oxygen molecules in this room co coalescing over in that corner of the, you know, the room. You could calculate the possibility, but the probability is so low it's never going to happen because it doesn't happen. And if God is who he says he is, and I'll, and I'll go with that, um, then why would he lie to us by not telling us? He, God has, in effect, you could, I'm, I'm stressing the point, but God has, in effect, bankrupted himself. God the Father, in effect, bankrupted himself by putting all of the sin of mankind on his son to redeem you and me to himself. And he doesn't tell us about some other civilization on Neptune or, or in some other galaxy. And then if I try to work through the physics, of, well, how do they transport? And how long does it take them? And why would they come here anyhow? What do I come up with? I, I used an example recently with someone. It just The closest star to us 
aside from the sun, is Alpha Centauri, 4.3 light years away. If we could travel at a million miles a year, which is a pretty good clip, it would take 70,000 years to travel between here and Alpha Centauri. And that's just the closest star. There, surely there must. We're using probabilities then of uh, the, the, some other civilization somewhere. And why would we come up with those probabilities? No one ever conjectured probabilities of life forms on some other planet or in some other galaxy until Darwin. And Darwin, in, in, in you know, The Descent of Man, gave us, quote unquote, some reason to believe that somehow organic life could be spontaneously generated from inorganic materials. And somehow our educational system went along with the whole thing and taught our generation that that was happening. And somewhere along the line, I woke up and smelled the bacon and realized that's not true. That can't be true. The only reason people even conjecture probabilities of a life form on another, in another galaxy is because of Darwin. Well, he was flawed from the beginning. He even says in his own book, in the appendix, when I consider the eye, I realize that the, the theory is untenable. So I'll just go with his own criticism of his theory rather than to believe it. So I'm, that was a lot more than you probably wanted from me. But uh, so yeah, I, I reject the idea that there could be a life form on another planet. That would mean God would have to lie and I would have to accept Darwin. And I'm, I'm not good on either one of those. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's my view of it. I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure I'm not. So. Danielle. So, we know Satan is known as the prince of this world. Yes. So, I learned a few years ago, like, he called himself, oh, Paul called the devil too as the prince of the air. Yes. Right? The prince of the power of the air. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if he has been here from the creation, from the beginning of the creation, and we see, you know, like a, this UFO object, right? Mm -hmm. Has been watched, you know, like from Peru, from Asia, mm -hmm. right? Peru, because we see, you know, like Egypt, we see Peru, we see Mexico too. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. Yeah. So all this light, you know, nobody can explain that. Mm -hmm. so that is just my, 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 my comment. Yeah. Because when we read Second Ephesians verse two, it says, "In which you want to walk it according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air." That's right. Mm -hmm. So, from my perspective in the scripture, I really trust this is the real and only truth in the whole history. I mean, that's right. Yeah. My, my perspective. I think like I is, you know, like straight from the devil. Like uh, from the ancient time, like just until now. Mm -hmm. so, no, you're right. Yeah, so just, and uh, hey, check this one out. He is the prince of the power of the air. And after the seven seals are opened on, on the scroll and those, those judgments, and um, after the, 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 seven, the seven trumpets judgments, and then the seven bowls, the six bowls of judgment, the final bowl, the last of all of those judgments, is going to be poured out on the air. I like that one. That's just sort of... Puts a, puts a period at the end of that sentence. Amen. Uh, two more. That's it. What do you got? Come on. Who? Oh! Oh, you moved up. You thought you would fool me. Into, uh, yeah. Yeah. My, um, in Mercer High School, so senior year, I had to study Satan and Satan and Satan. Okay. So I 
to the World Economic Forum, and when they had that in the back, they had the angel that broke free. Hmm. So the book is about sacred and where we, for 70,000 years ago, could have seven homo sapiens, and we could change our form. Not that we evolved, hmm. but we could change our form. And so then I thought, that's really weird. And then now they're coming out with, they're, they are saying they have the body. Yeah. And so now the one man that testified, he saw these aliens. He's going through the country now, and he's doing um, large um, meditation groups mm. where they all pray and ask for these aliens to come teach us because they have the power to train us. Yeah. And the Pope is going to baptize us. Yeah. Now, the Bari also believe in um, you know, doing brain and all. But I agree, the perception is not that they don't have to actually come through with what they're saying. We know that with no other people. Now, what they have to do is get our generation of children to believe it. And like you were saying, Satan owns the airway. Mm -hmm. And the image of, of the Antichrist dying, maybe it's the image of him coming back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but it is certainly, I don't know how to break that. I don't get into the high school to do it. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, uh, here's a, I think here's a good place for us as Christians to be. I mean, it's, and it sounds quippy to say this, but it's still true. I, I believe that um, at a time in my life, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out who the Antichrist was. Um, and the more I read the scripture, though, the more it just stares me in the face that he's not going to be revealed until we're gone. So I'm not going to spend my time looking for the Antichrist. I'm, I'm waiting for Jesus Christ. And um, I can't break Satan's power over certain things, but I can, I can stand for the truth. I, you know, it's not my children who I'm leading, per se, now, but my grandchildren. And uh, that's what I... Renee, that's what we have responsibility for in terms of our domain, if you will. Um, and I think for all of us that uh, as somehow interesting as it is for all of us to say, ooh, what if this and what if that? Yeah, what if? But what matters is Jesus Christ is coming back and at any time. You know, and he says, Jesus said, at, at a time when you, when, when you think not. So whatever you think is the time when Jesus is coming back, that's not it. You know, he's coming when you don't think he's coming. And, and you know, John says, First John, that, uh, that when we see him, we will be like him because we're going to see him as he is. In other words, so to speak, the technology of even who we are is going to change so that we have bodies like his because we wouldn't really see him as he is unless we had that new body. And he said, and so we're to prepare ourselves for that and to focus on that and that as we do that, that purifies our lives and our walk. And, we should, and that's where we should look. So it's, you know, it's always one of my concerns when I go into a study like this that you know, I kind of I called it brain candy early on. It's easy for it to sort of feel where it matters. Um, but let's, let's be looking for Jesus Christ. You know? One last one, if there is one. Oh, well, you didn't raise your hand before. I, I, I wanted to give everyone else a chance. Oh, okay. Well, let's pray then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jim. All right. So since, yeah, Miles, we'll, we'll end on, on this. So the Giants Nephilim, do you think that they're still around and alive today? Yeah, we'll just, we'll just go with that. Do I think that uh, the Nephilim slash Giants are around today? Yeah. Um. Yes and no. I mean, no in the sense that I don't have any um, uh, experience with them. Um, and yet at the same time, yes, in the sense that um, I do, you know, I, everybody talks, there's so much talk that goes on about Sasquatch, Bigfoot, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, 
but it's a, um, it kind of falls into that UFO category. There are so many observations of that. One of my favorite parts of Colorado where the dude, Jim, and I used to, to go um, was down in southwest Colorado, uh, Little Switzerland. And um, in that area, I still look at the reports. There are so many reports that come from that area of encounters that people have had in the middle. You know, and you, you always have to discount a lot of that because, you know, there's people who like to get their fame on the internet by saying, by making up a story. But at the same time, uh, there are those things. I, I, don't, I don't spend much time thinking about Sasquatch and, um, and, and, and Bigfoot, but uh, I do think that there are things like that. Having said that, um, I've also heard enough, uh, and you may be familiar with some of this, uh, one of the areas we don't like to think about very much is in human trafficking. Um, our tendency, as creepy as the whole topic is, our tendency is to think of human trafficking as a, <laughs> as, as a sexual, a deviant sexual thing, well, and it is. Um, first of all, you go back and closely read what Jude is saying, closely read what uh, Peter is writing about. Yes, they're talking about times and things that the devil was doing at that time or the angels who left their first to Satan, all that. But all of those things, the days before the flood, what was it? Sexual deviance. Um, the Sodom and Gomorrah, sexual deviance. And that's the point they're making. These angels went after strange flesh. It's se sexual deviance. And um, so when you, when you look at human trafficking, um, it's, I, I, I hate to minimize it by saying it's not only sexual deviance, but it isn't just sexual deviance. I do believe that um, there's a, there's a purpose, a, a, a really hard, dark purpose for abducting, um, especially young children. Um, the devil does that. The devil, for reasons I don't understand, but you go back in biblical history, go back in pagan history, Molech, you know, the worship of Molech was, I mean, it was, the, it was abortion, you know, after the child was uh, out of the womb. And... Um, but it was all to justify and to pay back the devil for, for sexual pleasures. And, and you go further and further. So when you look at uh, child abductions, things like this, I think that there's a lot of that going on. Um, and even one of the more recent accounts that I heard uh, of a woman who was involved in rescuing young women out of uh, uh, the slave trade, basically, um, you know, sexual slave trade was, you know, uh, those who, that she spoke to were talking about the giants, you know, in Thailand and places like that. So there's a lot that goes on. And I, and, and I don't, you know, some of you probably think he just believes whatever he hears. I don't. I, 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 I tend not to want, well, I don't want to believe it. And so I don't tend to. But the more I listen to things that begin to sort of checks the boxes for me, like, you know, I, th I start to think that's not a liar. There may be something to this. Um, so yes, I do think that there are, are giants, but I don't think that at this point, I think it's hard for us to understand why the devil would need giants. Um, I think there was some reason for that in the days before the flood, which incidentally, I know it's a whole different topic, but I I'll leave it here. But when you look at, I, you know, my friend and I we talked about earlier, you know, we used to look at places like Devil's Tower. If you're familiar with Devil's Tower out in uh, that's, uh, northeastern Wyoming, you look at that, and it looks like just a, a huge rock formation. Now look again. It's an old tree, but it's enormous. Um, and there's a lot of those kinds of we call rock formations, but they're petrified wood. Um, so there was a time in our, in our world in the days before the flood were giants and some of these giant places, Machu Picchu, places like that, uh, it kind of fit in terms of the gibberim, the men of renown. Does the devil need that today? I don't see it, but, but I don't, also don't know what it's going to look like after the rapture. The level of deception is, is going to be off the charts. And I think there'll be, I, I am inclined to think there will be that.
That's a long way to answer the question. What do you think? Do you think they're giants today? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I just think that there's too much, you know, evidence, you know, things, you know, you've got, you got burial grounds all over America and all over the world and stuff, and uh, that there just seems to be too much evidence that they're, they're, they're more than just being in Israel and that surrounding area, that mm -hmm. they're in worldwide and, and things of that nature, and I think it all just comes back down to what's the ultimate goal is, you know, was originally to stop the Messiah come, from coming, the best way to do that is to continue to corrupt the DNA of the human line, and you mm -hmm. can continue this, and, you know, I, again, there's a lot, I, I listen to Blurry Creeks and all, I just did it just to, you know, spark a little conversation, but, uh, <laughs> See what our family dinners were like. <laughs> It's not all fried chicken, let me tell you. <laughs> so look, um, uh, thanks, Jim. Um, <laughs> I know that this is a strange topic, but you obviously were strange enough to stick around. So, um, and and it, it ought not to be brain candy for us, it, uh, but this is real. And I think what's important for us to, to keep in mind is that, yes, these things are happening. But why? Because ultimately, and particularly after we're gone, and that doesn't mean it's not going to happen before, but especially after the rapture, um, the level of deception in this world is going to be enormous. And I'm not, I'm not trying to throw shots at anybody as far as, you know, uh, what people were willing to believe uh, a few years ago with the whole mm -mm thing. But um, deception and what people are willing to accept is coming big time. And, and we've already seen samples of it. It's amazing what people in what we'll call some kind of normal lifestyle right now, what people are willing to believe. Oy, you get a little bit more difficult and what people are going to be willing to believe and the government's going to rescue us, they'll say. Um, no, Jesus is my Savior. So why don't we stand?